Good. We're on to another fireside side chat. Of course, this time I'm with uh, my co-host who's joined me today, Dr. Tara Rutley from NASA. And we have the wonderful Esther Watsiki. Esther, such a pleasure to have you on. We're really looking forward to uh, talking to you this hour um, and um, really getting to know you more than uh, what we've got to know of you, especially uh, from, from our WhatsApp calls and, and everything else. Uh, we're we're going to come hard. We're warning you now, straight up. From, we're going to have all the tough questions. <laughs> Great. I'm excited. Thank you so much for including me. That was an amazing introduction. I loved your fireside introduction. <laughs> Fireball. <laughs> Fireballs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Tara Rutley, I'd love for you to do uh, your introduction, not that it's needed. And then, of course, uh, Esther, we're going to go straight into this. So I'm Tara Rutley. First of all, I'm a mom. So it's a pleasure to be uh, able to talk to Esther tonight and, and seek some of her wisdom as I'm halfway through her book, How to Raise Successful People. And uh, I am Associate Chief Scientist uh, for Gravitational Research at NASA Headquarters. I've been at NASA for 20 years, uh, working in human exploration and space station type of science. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, so, so Dr. Rutley has been reading the book uh, that Esther uh, had published and written herself, of course, uh, How to Raise Successful People, Simple Lessons for Radical Results. Esther, welcome so much again. Uh, I've got to start off with this. Is it true that you put your five-year-old daughter on a commercial flight by herself with just a locket or a, a necklace? Yes, I did that. Is that in the book? Did I, I can't remember if I... Not yet. It's not in the book. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so this was, this was Anne. That's true. And um, she wanted to go visit my mother in Los Angeles. And I just didn't have time to drive her there or anything. So um, I said, well, how would you like going on the plane by yourself? And she said, yeah, that's great. So um, I put her on the plane with just, she had kind of a luggage tag around her neck. <laughs> and it had my phone number on it and it had my mother's phone number. And we didn't have cell phones in that time. So, you know, it was her home phone. And then, I don't know, she went on the plane. She just walked right on the plane. It was, she didn't even wave goodbye. <laughs> she was just, and then she got to LA and apparently she just acted like she was an adult, just walked off the plane with their little suitcase. So <laughs> yes, five <Wow>. years old, <laughs> I all about that one. Yeah, I, somebody must've told you about that, yeah. Anne was very proud of herself. <laughs> Golly, I would say. Wow. Do, do you still have that conversation with Anne now? And what does she think of it now, now that she realized that she was on that flight by herself? Um, well, you know, unfortunately now, airports are really different and you have to go through security and there's mm. all kinds of issues. So back then I was able as a mother just to walk right up to the gate and then just, you know, say goodbye. And th they didn't have the security that they have now. So I think it would be more difficult to do it now to send a small child through security by herself and then, you know, walk through the airport by yourself. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't, I haven't seen in my experience flying and I've been, fl I was flying a lot prior to the pandemic. Um, I never did see a child on the plane by themselves, N not, no one ever. And I think flying has just changed. And now with this pandemic, I think it's changed all over again. So, um, you know, I, I think that um, Zoom calls are here to stay, by the way. <laughs> and um, I'm just con concerned about what's going to really happen with education <laughs> You know, what percentage of time are students actually going to be in class as opposed to at home? Are we going to have like every other day or, you know, who knows what's going to happen? But I think things are changing. Yeah, you know, I do. I do. My, my daughter, she's 14. She just turned 14 and uh, she's in virtual. The last time she stepped foot in the classroom was March of, of last year. And, right. and in fifth grade, we actually pulled her out on purpose and put her in a, a, a virtual charter school 
so that we could pay attention to her her learning and find out her deficits and work with her her dad and I you know we would take turns doing subjects and before and after work and things and so that was purposeful and that platform was amazing it was it was really eye opening for her, for us then she went back to public school and now here here we are again in 8th grade accidentally virtual in a public school setting which was not intended for that and it's got its own new set of challenges and that's um you know she at first she thought it was great being home <laughs> well going to school in her pjs and now she's like there's a, there's a reason we go and we need to be there in person so um but she's, she's learning so many things though i will say about paying attention when she's home we're able to teach her things like test taking skills we're able to make sure she can write that good essay and that she really knows those that pre-algebra so there's benefits to to the homeschooling but i know that we are uh, in a unique situation that my husband and I are both able to be here for her every day because we are also working from home. That's not the case for everybody too. So. Right. No, that I think that's harder for everybody, but it's yeah. lucky. And there are distinct advantages to yeah. the, to the online education and to having um, that kind of, it, you can really get individual attention that way. And yeah. so I, that's why I think that we're going to end up with a mixture and um, I wrote yeah. this book prior to my, to the one we're talking about, how to raise successful people, and it's called Moonshots in Education. And I talked about a lot of this in that book. That was 2015, and it's called. It's an introduction to what I called blended learning. It's a blend of technology and traditional. And, so now, and now here we are. <laughs> a blend. Yeah. We we didn't plan on having it, but we have it. So we need to figure out how to make it work. Absolutely. Yeah, of all the of all the schools around the country and around the world who've had to put this virtual platform in place, I'd love to see them keep it and build on it. Yeah, I do too. Mm -hmm. So I think they will, you know, um, it's just right now it's harder for teachers because they have yes. usually class of 30 and 15 of the kids are there and the other yep. 15 are. And so it's just more complicated. Yep. They, they have to figure out a system, make it work. That's exciting, though, that you have your daughter at home and that you were able to, that you and your husband were able to offer her all that support. It's great. I think we're the best case scenario. Um, well, there's a lot of other kids, you know, that really, if they pay attention online, they can really learn a lot. That's I think the hard part. It's that if you can pay attention online. It's capturing their attention. And even our yeah. daughter was bored. You know, we had to, we have to drag her down here sometimes and stare at her while she stares at her screen because she's just like oh it's just way more boring but if you can create awesome content that's engaging and something that they can relate to right. um they're gonna wanna and they'll learn you know that way and that's the million dollar question it i know i always get asked and maybe you too esther and you you're leading into that with some of the work that you're doing is how do you capture the attention of these of these these students um, and, and meet them where they are. And, and we're older and we're not as cool. So, but we know what they what they're watching and what they're looking at. And so the creative, the really creative educational minds know, know, have these, have these great ideas on how to reach these students. And use your social media platform for good that way if you can. Well, I have just one simple tip that might make a difference for all the teachers or for all the parents that are listening. And that is, Give the kids some independence. Let them choose. Let them have some control. The number one problem with the school yeah. system in general is that just look at who's in control. Yes. It's actually the school board. Yep. Followed, and the superintendent and the principal and the teacher all follow the directions of the school board. And the last person who can make any change is the student. Yes. <laughs> They're yes. just stuck. You know, they were like, Absolutely. oh, we have to learn this. It's fifth grade, or we have to learn this. It's eighth grade, whatever it is. And the relevance of whatever they're forced to learn is never really made clear. So that's frequently, right. Frequently, kids are learning things and they're like, why do I have to learn this? And the classic answer is <laughs> because it's on the test on Friday. And if you don't, oh, no. Gonna fail. That's, that's it, really. She well. If I tried that that answer around this house, because I hear that question every day. If I tried that with her, she'd be like, no, "No, that's not. That's not cutting it. No." So she she does ask me that, Esther. Like more so now that she's virtual, I hear it 
like three, at least three times a day versus when she was at school and didn't have as much time to talk to me about it. But right. so we, as many, as much as we can try to find the relevance, we uh, drilling it in the relevance, drilling it in. But when they're in school, like you said, that they're under control of the, of, of the, uh, the, the system, right? right. And system. I mean, there's so many kids, there's just, you can't reach them all like the way that they should be, not the way we do it now. Right. Well, if you think also about it, you know, those, maybe, maybe you have, you know, 70% of the kids that are engaged in doing what they should be. Yeah. You have that 30% that aren't. Right. And, you know, they grow up together with those other kids. That's part of their group, yeah. their generation. And if they don't have skills and they don't have jobs, we all suffer. Everyone together, we're all suffering. So that's why it's important to engage all those kids, everybody, every single kid, um, right. so that we can all, you know, everybody wants to lead a pretty happy life. And it's hard Absolutely. to lead a happy life when your neighbor is suffering. Such that's a good it. point. I, you know what, what you've touched on there, in fact, I was uh, WhatsApping Dr. Rutley, I think at some crazy hour, I was like, do you feel that, you know, if you look at the unemployment rate with how technology is accelerating um, and the gap between uh, learning the skills necessary to essentially reskill or upskill to tackle these new jobs, do you think that gap is getting vaster and vaster and we're heading for uh, a situation which um, will not only lead to mass unemployment, but will cause an even bigger divide than there ever has been between uh, those who have all the opportunities at the top and everybody else is trying to pay catch up just because of the skills divide itself and, and the way technology is going to, uh, well, it's already disrupted so many industries, but it's only going to disrupt them even further. So I'm sorry to say that what you just said is true. It's going to happen, I think, unless we can do something about it quickly. And um, so one of the groups that I work with is is actually called Skyhive. They're a Canadian firm and their main job is reskilling. And, you know, reskilling people that have lost their jobs. And what can we do to help them get jobs that, so they get a job, let's put it that way. Um, but a lot of the kids coming out of colleges even don't have the skills necessary to get a job. And that's why that big debate has been happening about, is college worth it? Should I be paying for my child to go to college if in fact, when he's done, he won't get a job? So I think we need to rethink what we're doing in the college education, also in high school education. And I've been working with a friend of mine, his name is Sebastian Thrun. He has a company that's it's been around for a long time called Udacity. And Udacity is it's similar to Coursera because it's online um, learning. Coursera is is basically lectures online for colleges. His is different, but different in the way that he's got it's interactive. Coursera is all lecture based and Udacity is interactive and it also targets specific jobs that are hungry for uh, workers. So there's a lot of tech jobs in there. And so I think, but the, you know, the reason that he's doing well is because the schools aren't meeting that need. It's there. It's not in school. You know, we're, they're still taking the same kind of subjects I took when I went to school, you know, and that was a long time ago. So when, when are we going to change that? When are we going to make these changes so kids actually graduate with a lot of the skills that we all need? You know, they tech skills, they're like collaboration skills. You don't learn to collaborate by sitting side by side in a class. And communication skills, you need to learn to communicate. Critical thinking skills, we need more of that. And creativity. You cannot learn to be creative if you aren't willing to take a risk. Creativity is a risk. Anyone that's creative is doing something someone else hasn't done before. And so by most of the time, you know, it's not right. You have to do it again. 
So anyway, that's my, I don't know, theory on how we need to make schools more relevant to the real world. And um, at, I'm actually really interested in what you're doing too at NASA. I know you guys have internships, um, a lot of them. And those are fantastic opportunities for kids. And I don't know, do they have them this year as well? They do, they're having them virtually. I had my first set of interns virtually over the summer too, and we kept them busy. We They were busy. It's not the same, um, of course, because they can't get to the centers and get their hands on e equipment and, and things, but, but we keep them engaged mentally with things to do research um, and as much as they can. And then, and they, they, fortunately with NASA internships, you get a rotation of three semesters long. So you, you get to rotate through. So so while these some of these students had to do virtual, um, they'll they'll come back and they'll be able to be hands on as well. Uh, but we learned a lot on dealing with the interns. Um, uh, and, and in some cases, we were able to even connect them with experts that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to connect with, because now we started using like Microsoft Teams so easily. And uh, and so, you know, I, I had one uh, intern who was interested in being an astronaut, but maybe thinking she might want to go the, the medical route. So I was able to connect her and we had a, a three way conversation with an astronaut who had a medical background and and things like that, which may not have been able to be so easily accessible if it wasn't for the virtual world. So like you said, a mix. Of, I like this new mix. We we do need more hands on. We need to get back, of course, and our right. interns need to get back to the centers. but we certainly have made the most of it and we didn't give up. We didn't quit. <laughs> That's great. That is great. So all the parents that might be listening, if your child has nothing to do this summer, see whether they can't be an intern. You know, it's really, it's a very valuable experience. for An all apprenticeship kids. too. Like I think you right. said in your book, apprentice, I, my daughter wants to, to, to bake. She wants to be a pastry chef. So for me, I'm looking around at small bakeries asking if she can make, dough or something like that just you know a couple hours just to see if that's something she really likes apprenticeship paid or unpaid is valuable skills uh, right it's really valuable so <laughs> and there's a lot of groups that are going to need apprentices at this point because they're most of them are not paid but can you imagine the learning that you get and it's free so i would say right. that yeah that's a great idea Yep. That's also in the UK, they've announced uh, nearly 100 million worth of uh, funding um, to help bridge the skills gap. And apprenticeships is a big topic that's come up. Uh, in fact, it's one of our main drivers. Um, and what people are obviously thinking now is, well, as you said, do we go to university or do we just go the apprenticeship route? Um, I'd love to know how early do you think kids need to be engaged? Uh, for them to have that base knowledge, for them to be creative, be great communicators? You know, what, what, what would you say is the starting point? Well, I like to think of it, at, you know, in the middle of elementary school. Um, I, I also like to think of it even earlier, but it's harder for a lot of people. So I would suggest maybe starting at eight, eight years old, or maybe... Um, nine years old, what you want to do is give them an opportunity to do something real. And um, it could be around the house. It could be for a neighbor. There's a lot of things that young kids can do. And um, I mean, what's happened in our society is that parents have pampered their children to such a degree. It's the helicopter parenting problem. So it's so much that University of California, Berkeley was offering a course on adulting. And this was to thousands of kids. And they were taking a course on how to do the laundry, you know, how to set up a checking account, how to manage your finances, how to boil an egg, um, how to make your bed. I, I mean, honestly, I couldn't believe it. And also, it was one of the most popular classes at the university. And it was because they didn't know how to do it because their parents aren't letting them do it. So yeah, we, we need, there's a lot of apprentice 
like jobs that can happen in the community. Um, and uh, kids, young kids can do things. I mean, even it can, how many kids are watering the plants or feeding the dog? You know, I don't see a lot of that happening anymore. And so that is something that they could do and start early. They can do it, you know, it's worldwide. And so it's not just, you know, in the US or the UK or whatever. It's everywhere they can do it. And a lot of people have asked you over the years, and I was discussing this talk to Dr. Rutley as well uh, about advice and how to educate. Of course, you worked with uh, so many people that people look up to. Uh, they say you inspired Steve Jobs. Um, I'd love to hear the Google story as well. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've had to repeat this so many times, but they say Google was essentially started in your garage. Uh, and would love to know how that all came to being and, and what made those people involved at that point, if you know, in the garage so successful, what was a driving force uh, and, and what was different about them to, to kind of make, uh, to have this world to succeed? <laughs> That's, yes, you're right. A lot of people like that story about Google and where it started and how it started. So I'll just tell you the story briefly. Um, so it started, actually, my daughter, Susan, got married. And uh, she went off on her honeymoon. And prior to getting married, they bought the house. They bought a house. And I was like, oh, that's really exciting. You know, they're getting married. They got a house and so forth. And she was gone for about a month on this honeymoon, came back. And then I don't know what happened um, beforehand or afterward, but she suddenly realized that the mortgage payment was due and that she didn't have any money. <laughs> and so the question is, what is she going to do now? You know, and her mom and dad are, you know, they're benevolent, but not long-term. And so she had to do something <laughs> to make sure she could actually pay the rent. So then this house was a big house. Um, it was not, not huge, but big. It had six bedrooms and three bathrooms. So you can imagine. And I was like, gee, do you really need all those bedrooms? Don't you need just one? And so <laughs> how many bathrooms do you need? So um, what they decided to do is like, well, we don't need all, all those bedrooms downstairs and we don't need all this other stuff. Why don't we just rent the garage? And so I said, why don't you look around at Stanford, see who you can find. There must be somebody over there that needs it. And sure enough, there were these, two geeky guys and they had started something and they didn't have a place to put it. And um, so she said, okay, I'll rent you the garage. But then what turned out, they had so much stuff didn't fit into the garage. So she ended up renting them three bedrooms and two of the bathrooms in addition to the garage. And, um, so they moved in and there were wires everywhere. I'm not kidding. Computers, wires, the whole, it was incredible. And the other thing, which she never counted on, because she nobody would ever know, right? Is they never went home. <laughs> they never, she thought it was going to be nine to five. And it was like nine in the morning till nine. I mean, it just went on and on. I don't know. Some nights they just slept on the couch. And um, so that's how it all started. And, then when she realized, she's like, what is this Google stuff? You know, I see it on the computers. It's Google everywhere. And um, so she decided to try it. She was working at Intel. And she's like, hmm. After she tried it for a couple of weeks, she's like, this is really useful. You know, it beats Yahoo because I have to use a yellow pages on Yahoo. Actually, it's the craziest thing. I have it right here. I bet, I bet most people have never seen this. Yellow pages. This is Oh, beautiful. wow. <laughs> yes. And there were tons of these books. This was one just, this one was just if you wanted to know anything about the health issues. And um, so she decided that that looked like it was a pretty good group. And um, they, they wanted her because what they basically said to her was that, well, we know how to find information. 
We're really good at algorithms, but we don't have a clue how to make money. Can you help us make some money? We're never going to be able to survive if we can't make any money. And so she was hired as the first person to help figure out how to make money and the PR person. And what was funny about that is that she had the job of being in charge of PR with no budget, none. <laughs> She's like, how am I supposed to do this, mom? And um, so one of the things that we ended up doing is that everybody was given a t-shirt that said Google on it. And everybody wore, we had to wear our t-shirts all the time. And we were, we were walking publicity um, for Google. But actually, as you know, what happened is that just like Susan, people tried it. And then after they tried it, they realized they could actually find what they wanted. So the word spread pretty quickly. And so that's, that's the story. And yeah, a lot of what, a lot of the culture of Google was established in that house. And a lot of it is, in, they didn't have the acronym trick um, because, you know, I made that for the book, but basically their, their philosophy was, and that was, you know, after they talked about it quite a bit, their philosophy was we're hiring the best people we can find and we're trusting them. It's a flat organization. Nobody is going to sit at the top and tell everybody what to do. So there was a lot of trust and respect and independence. Everything was collaborative. It's the whole trick model and kindness. They wanted to take really good care of their employees. And so food was the number one thing. We want everybody to always have food whenever they want. So they have free breakfast, lunch, dinner. They have micro kitchens. They have, I mean, you can stay there till two o'clock in the morning and you can always find food. And then there were, it's kind of crazy too, because let's say you want to take a nap. You can actually take a nap. Well, that was based, of course, back in the garage. But there were, Google had these, I don't know what you call them. I, I'm not sure they have a name but they were sort of like big circular dome things and you could go inside and close it and lie down. <laughs> it was really crazy. And so I tried it, by the way, it was pretty cool. Nobody could see you, <laughs> Nobody, you could actually lie. It was so peaceful in there. So, you know, I think that's one of the main things that people miss in the pandemic, the food, <laughs> because they're not able to get the Google food. And they also miss all the other services, like these places you could take a nap. And um, there were they have dry cleaning and hair cutting and doctor, and they want to take care of you. You know, they really care about the employee, the whole employee, not just um, not just while you're there. And there's no time clock, by the way, no time clock. You will come to. To work, you know, when it works for you. But, you know, you work in a team. So I think there's consensus as to when people are going to come. Yeah, I must say, it's a great place. Amazing. And it's still amazing. Um, even though it's so big, and some of the culture has changed. I still think it's one of the best places to work, because everybody's respected. And that that makes all the difference. It really is uh, an incredible. And our the new um, CEO Sundar Bachai, he is wonderful. He's an incredible person. And he started. He was born in India, and he has humble roots. And he's very focused on doing good and education, and you know, just making the world a better place for everyone. So. Very happy I'm still connected to Google. <laughs> wow, and, and again, you know, Google is just one of them. Um, that, and Google is just a fantastic uh, entity, which is really ingrained in everybody's life. Uh, you know, we're, we're all kind of involved with Google uh, in one shape or another. Of course, another legend and, and people who did look up to him was Steve Jobs. We'd love for you to share about your time with Steve. And obviously, I think, uh, you, you spent time mentoring uh, his daughter, was it? And um, Lisa. Lisa. Yeah, actually, multiple. He has four kids, 
And so three of the four were in my programs. Um, yeah, Steve. So I got along really well with Steve and I met him one afternoon. It was actually late in the afternoon. And I was instructional supervisor for English at that time in Palo Alto. And at about four o'clock in the afternoon, some guy just came into my office and started to, to ask me about my program in journalism and what like, okay. And so we talked for about an hour and I guess I could tell he liked what I was saying, whatever it was. I don't remember the whole conversation. It was a lot of what do you do in class and how do you do it and all that sort of stuff. And like, Two days later, his daughter was enrolled in, in my class. I was Lisa, Lisa Brennan Jobs. And um, he had pulled her out of private school in Los Al It was in uh, Menlo Park. And I'm not sure which school it was. I think it might have been Crystal Springs, or I don't know for sure. But um, she was a great kid, really liked her. And uh, then I didn't know who he was other than he was a parent, right? And so um, he spent a lot of time just hanging around my class. I guess if he didn't have something to do, he just would come by and hang out. And um, I liked him. I, I thought he, you know, he was really an interesting person to talk to. And he was always transparent. You know, that's what I liked best about him was that I could always, I could tell where I was coming from right away. There was no, no, nothing fake. Um, and I tend to be pretty transparent also. So we got along really well. And then his daughter was, so she started in the 10th grade and 11th grade, the 12th grade. And um, she became one of the editors in chief of the newspaper that I ran. Uh, she together with three other girl, three other people, I guess two were girls and two were boys uh, who became editor. And I'm still in touch with her today. She's a great person. And, um, and then his other daughter, Eve was also in the program. The program grew by the way. So I started with 20 kids in 1984. And today the program has over 700 kids and 10 publications. And, um, so at, anyway, at that that's basically the situation. But I've spent a lot of time with a lot of these kids because I stay in touch with them. And I can say that's thanks to Facebook. Thank you, Facebook. Because, <laughs> because everybody complains about Facebook. Okay, I have my complaints too. But they do help you stay in touch with people. And so I know my students all the way back to when I first started teaching, you know, 19... Well, I don't have anyone from 84, but 85 I do, 85 all the way to the present time. And uh, it's very exciting to be in touch with all these kids who are now, you know, probably your age. Um, but <laughs> I still think of them as kids. But for me, it's, a, it's an exciting experience. Uh, what he, oh, The other thing he did, Steve, um, at... You know, I won a grant. I got a grant from the state of California for Macintosh computers, and that was in '84 before I met him. I had met him, didn't meet him until the '90s. But then, when he was coming into my class and looking at all the time at the computers, he was always telling me how this computer wasn't very good, and that one wasn't very good, and this was not, and whatever. And I was like, well, you know, this is school. You know, don't expect me to be able to get one. <laughs> But what was remarkable about him is like tomorrow, a computer or several would show up in a Federal Express box. So he was incredible. He donated a lot of equipment to me, not to mention the expertise, you know, that if I had a question, I mean, it was crazy. I had his cell phone. I could just phone him. It's like, oh, my God, this is not working. What do I do now? <laughs> Isn't, that's pretty great. He was, he. I know he had problems in the company. I know there were problems in his parenting, but 
I also know that he had a pretty soft heart. So that's my experience with Steve Jobs. And he was definitely a visionary. And uh, I remember a lot of the stuff that he told me that would happen. And he kept talking about having a phone in your pocket, you know, and I was, that was back in the middle of the 90s. There were no phones in anyone's pocket. You had to sit at home and wait for a phone call. So, you know, I was like, yeah, I can hardly wait till we have a phone in our pocket. <laughs> the sooner, the better. Yeah. So that's it. And Lorene is a good friend of mine also. Um, and she is also amazing. She's an amazing entrepreneur and she's, you know, a really clear thinker. And she owns uh, the Atlantic Monthly magazine. She And she's also doing trying to do a lot in education. So she started something called uh, XQ, I believe it is. It's a way to change the schools. And she also has been involved in something called College Track for years, where she helps low-income kids go to school. Yeah, Lorene is... She's a force of nature. She is great. Um, so Steve picked a good wife. Wow. You know, we, we, we're talking, uh, we talked about the Google guys. We talked about Steve Jobs. And um, we're talking about them. And these are people we often see in social media and TV and uh, so on. Um, I, again, with uh, Dr. Tara Rutley, who's based at NASA, so she has more uh, of an insight into uh, some of these great visionaries. But there's one more name I'm going to have to mention, and that's Elon Musk. I'd love for you to talk about, you know, your experience with Elon, as 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 you know him quite well, and uh, your kind of views on on space and Mars. And I'd love for Dr. Tara Rutley to take it from there, because after you hear the stories I've just heard, there's not much more I can really fathom to ask you. So I'm going to let Dr. Tara Rutley take over, but I'd love for you to talk about uh, your views on Elon and space. And, and, and then I'd love to talk about uh, this exciting new project, of course, that you started, but more, I'll, I'll let you continue. So, yes, I did spend a lot of time with Elon. Um, actually, like a whole week with Elon on a boat. So you can imagine when you're on a boat, you can't get off and there's nowhere else to go. Um, he is a, really a very uh, innovative guy. He's really nice. He's somewhat shy, to be honest. You know, it's kind of, you wouldn't find that hard to believe considering what he's doing. Um, but he is a little bit shy. And the thing that is very interesting about Elon for me is that he is, he's got a lot of grit. He's willing to make mistakes and try new things and not be worried about it. I think that comes from his childhood and from, you know, grew up in South Africa. And he also um, was in Canada for a while. And what happened is that his mother was busy trying to earn a living. So she couldn't pay a lot of attention to him, which turned out to be a gift. So he was able to do a lot of things that he liked doing, which he was really interested in computers early on. So he spent a lot of time with computers and programming and things like that. He didn't do so well in school. Just so for all the parents out there who are worried about your kid who is not getting good grades, don't worry. You can stop worrying now. So he did not get good grades. He had a hard time. His mom was always worried, but, you know, she just like, it's up to him, whatever he wants to do. And um, so he, he did eventually graduate from university in Canada. Um, but with regard to, you know, he was always interested in having electric cars. I swear, uh, you know, that was in an era when I just remembered electric cars seemed like something out of a science fiction magazine. And, you know, that, I don't know, people from Mars were going to fly down and give us electric cars. But um, 
I think if you look at his personality and the fact that he believes in himself and he's got a lot of grit, you know, um, I think that is what, one of the most important things for parents to realize. Because if you have a child who really wants to do something, and let's say you're a doctor, a lawyer, or I don't know, a teacher, and your child wants to do something totally different, um, I think it's always important to respect your child and what they want to be, what they want to do. And um, and so I think that that is what happened. His mom respected that. And I'm also good friends with his mom, who's, she is remarkable, you know. She's like a runway a model. You know, she's 70 years old or something like that. And she's on the cover of all these magazines. Um, she, she is incredible. And she wrote a book, by the way. And what is, let me just think about what the name, um, I think it's A Woman Makes a Plan is the name of the book. Her name is May Musk. And it's M-A-Y-E Musk. And so her book is great. Um, and she also had a difficult time. So a lot of us have had difficult times in this pandemic. And if you read her story in her book, you'll see her life was really a challenge, a really big challenge. And so I think the idea is don't give up. Don't, you know, have hope because things are getting better. They're getting better for all of us in the world. And pretty soon, hopefully, we're all going to be vaccinated worldwide. And hopefully this pandemic will, you know, disappear and we'll be able to go back to life. Well, maybe not exactly like we had it, but close. And so that's one thing that you should just know about her, that she definitely had a challenge. And um, and as far as space, Elon has been trans, he's been challenged and loved space for years, you know, ever since I, I met him. Talk, he talked about things that I personally thought of as, like I said, science fiction. Science fiction, really, you know. But now it's happening, you know, and, and this rocket, you know, his launches and, you know, he's like, the government can't do it, I'm going to do it kind of thing. And we're going to Mars. And it's like, okay, okay, you know. And, but a lot of his stuff, he started his own school for his children. He's like, I didn't like the school. I don't want it, my kids to be educated that way. And he started his own school. So he believes in himself. And also he believes in doing good. He really is very concerned about making sure that the world is better. He's, he's a, has a good heart. Good, and so does, does his mom and his brother too. Kimball, I know him as well. Um, he is focused on restaurants and gardening, and he wants kids in school to be able to understand how gardening impacts the world and so forth. So he's got that project that I um, forgot what it's called. I'm sorry, but it's it's Kimball Musk, and you can just look up his gardening projects. And then he's they also have a sister, and she's involved in um, in film. She's a, a either a producer or a videographer or or maybe a director, but she's doing some pretty incredible stuff as well. It's a great family. So that's my experience with the Musk family. Dr. Rutley, I'd love for you to come in because you were three years old when <laughs> you had a dream yourself, right? You you wanted to work for NASA, you wanted to be an astronaut. You've yeah. also read the uh, book that Esther has written. Uh, I'd love for you to come in and just, you know, share whatever you'd like to share and 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 ask anything you want to ask. <laughs> so the first time I, I was able to, to meet Esther on a video, uh, the first thing I asked her, I had read like a few pages of her book and I said, I have a 13 year old, is it too late for me? You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> can I, can I, is there still time to save her? <laughs> and, yes, uh, was the answer. Yes, was the yes. answer. Uh, use the trick, you know, and trust and, and get her, make sure she's communicating with you is what, is what, uh, what her response was. And uh, so, so, uh, so, so we started, I started reading the book and then my husband got a copy and he started reading the book. And I got to the point where, um, where I was reading, there's a piece in there that said, you know, you need to uh, assess your own childhood, seriously, get down there and assess your own childhood. And I thought, I've done this. I grew up with a single mom, you know, in, in Louisiana, she, 
kid not gone to college. I was first generation, low income, all that. I was like, I've done this. I was the older, I get it. You know, so I kind of, you said not to in the book, but I kind of moved through. And then, and then, and then like the next day, you know, my husband's like, so what page are you on? And I was like, I don't know, like a hundred or something. And he's like, oh, well, we should talk about the the self-assessment. <laughs> you know, and my husband, I've known him since I was in eighth grade. Like, so we kind of grew up together. And so we, he started pointing things out about my family. I was like, fine, you know, and then I started, so we went through P-R-I-C-K, we're like, we took this, you know, we did the, the actual real assessment. Um, and so, uh, and so we're not doing so bad. We're doing okay. I think the hardest thing for parents these days, or at least for me, is that, that independence part for two reasons. One, if we're in such a hurry these days, you can't, we're in the habit of, I got to do it myself. It's just easier and quicker. I got this. And as a parent, it takes just so much more patience and only maybe 30 seconds or a minute, but it seems like forever for you to sit there and say, yep, go do that. You got this. You know, you you have to, it's like, you have to be aware in the moment when it's happening because you just, it, you just want to blow through. And and it, it's one of the things, to, the things you need to learn as a parent. And, um, and, and the second part about independence though, Esther is, even though I know we're in low, the lowest crime rates in a long time, you know, our generation grew up with kids on the pictures of kids on the milk carton missing, right? So our right. generation is thinking, my kid's going to go around the corner and we'll never see her again. We, we've got all these, you know, America's Most Wanted. We grew up with those shows and things like that. So as a parent, it's like I, since we've moved to DC, I, I, she's been able to walk to the store, you know, a lot more. She started walking at, you know, uh, 12 and and she takes her own. We have a kid's credit card for her so she can do these things. But I'm like Watson, you know, it's so hard to just let go. And as I was reading your book, I thought, what must that feel like to just say, you know what, you got this and you're going to come back alive and everything. You know, it's like, what must that feel like? It's so scary. Oh, well, thanks. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> it is really scary. It's very hard to do. But I think what you need to do and what all parents need to do is look at the statistics. Mm -hmm. The majority, like 90% of the kidnappings are done by people the kid knows. Family yeah. knows. They're yeah. not done by strangers. And um, so I think we all saw those cartons and those kids missing but if you look at all those kids missing, it was like a, it's a divorced parent that steals the child or an uncle or somebody else that's taking the child. But there are states now, um, there's about eight of them that have passed laws that forbid parents for, uh, for allowing their child to walk down the street with another child if they are not a certain age. and. Um, so it's embedded in our culture, this fear of giving children independence. And that's part of why, you know, you're never going to see a five-year-old child on the plane by themselves. Or, you know, um, I sent my two daughters, Susan and Janet, um, to Europe by themselves. Susan was 12 and Janet was 10 and a half. And they changed planes by themselves at JFK. So That's incredible. That, would never, that would never happen today. People just wouldn't do it. And, um, but it's, it's cultural. And so if you go to other, some of the other countries, like if you go to Australia or New Zealand, you know, you don't have this fear of other people. They're, they're not frantic and fearful. You can let your kid walk down the street and, Anyway, there are communities in the U.S. where it's fairly safe, but I'm just putting fairly because parents are still worried. You're right. Yeah, I, mean, I live in one of those fairly safe communities, and I'm still worried. But but you know now that now even with everybody's cameras and everybody's track your phones, it's just it's just this this edge that we live with. But but to to uh, to improve their independence, they they've got to they've got to experience what it's like to to walk into a place themselves, communicate for themselves. She asked me the other day how old she had, had to be before she could go to a restaurant by herself. And I'm like, well, I think, you know, we've got restaurants and walking distance. I think you can go in as long as you can pay, you know, I don't know, are there rules about 
kids going into restaurants by themselves? I don't know. I don't think there are any rules about it, but you know, like nobody can go into a restaurant now anyway. Everything's yeah, out. Right, right. Yeah. So can't go into a restaurant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> True. I, I think that this fear is all the result of social media and social media. Oh. The communication is so fast. Yes. So you know, literally, you know, if some kid has something bad that happens to them in New York and you're in California, you can hear about it five minutes later. Yes. Yeah. And, and so while it's great to get all that information, it's also fearful. And on my phone, you know, I've got two phones here because I have to have both. Um, Apple and Pixel. <laughs> but um, I am not kidding. There are every day, there's a whole list of terrible things that happen to people who have taken the virus, the, the vaccine. And I mean, I wonder if they're really true or whether they're all, you know, exaggerated. And that is to make people right. fearful, really. Right. It's just crazy. You are right. You are right about that. A lot of a lot of uh, communications out there are based on fear. That is a really good point, and we're all susceptible to it. Yep. Yeah, and so then you know you're afraid to go outside. You're afraid to talk to people. Yes. There's, I mean, people are you know the stuff that used to be just ordinary, hugging people. Now we're afraid to hug people. It's just yeah. ridiculous. And you know right. when is this going to end? Um, well, I hope hope we all get vaccinated pretty quickly, yeah. and, and we'll get better slowly. But it's hard to change people's habits, and it we're is. habituated to just being fearful. We're afraid of everything. That's a. I will. You know, I'll have that conversation with my daughter. That's really good, and I will keep that in front of my mind, actually. Uh, and so, I I, I also know that um, I think I read in your book that you've retired recently in the last few years from, was it like 40 years of teaching at Palo Alto High? So I retired technically from <laughs> Palo Alto High School in June of 2020. Okay. I kind of realized that maybe it was not a good idea for me to teach in the pandemic and perhaps I wanted to do something else. So instead, I didn't really retire. I just retired from the school district. I started a company with my former students and um, turns out this is harder than teaching. <laughs> and oh, that's so, awesome. <laughs> that's really a challenge. Yes. Yeah, so the former student is Ari Memar. He's now the CEO and the company is called Tract, T-R-A-C-T dot app. And what we're doing is embedding my teaching philosophy into an app for kids. So it's peer to peer student based learning paths that hopefully will empower your child to think independently, be more creative and um, communicate more effectively. What I call the four C's communication, critical thinking, creativity, and collaboration. Those are the four C's that we need for the 21st century. Anyway, so track it's built into tract. And so I'd like to welcome as many parents with kids between the ages of eight and 14 who might want to join. Um, it's a place where you can send your kid and say, without worrying, this is a place where they're going to learn something and they'll learn the four C's. And they're also going to be connected to the United Nations goals for the 21st century. And it's, it's a, it's a great program. And this month we're celebrating Women's History Month. And we have some amazing people, including Megan Smith, who was the chief technology officer for the Obama administration. Right. Yes, of course. So she's leading one of our shows. And then we're hoping uh, we've heard from Maria Shriver. And she will also be another one. And we have a, a, an amazing young woman named Jatanjali Rao, I believe is how you spell her name. She was the Time Magazine Kid of the Year. Did you see there was a Kid of the Year for the yeah, first time? Right. Yeah, right. And yeah. she was the Kid of the Year, and she's going to be doing learning paths and training for other kids on the platform. Fantastic. So the goal is 
hey, can we all get together? We kids do something that makes a difference to us, to the world. And um, so, yes, I'm very excited about that. So I didn't really retire. I just <laughs> listened. And by the way, we can give all the parents that are listening um, access, free access to the learn to that tract if they type in W O J. That's my nickname, by the way. Waj W O J dot track dot app and the coupon code is W O J. How's that for really simple? <laughs> and so they can try it. They can try it for free. Put your kid on there and then you'll see. They will they'll find it really interesting and they're doing things like how to grow a one ton pumpkin. Okay, so maybe you don't want a one-ton pumpkin in your garden, but at least the science behind it is very, very interesting. You know, there you'll see that a lot of the these are all created by kids, so of course they're a little far out there. Um, but the goal is to empower them and to have them learn about things that they want to learn about that were not taught in school. And what a brilliant way for them to, to learn from other students, someone, they, their peers, someone they can relate to. And right. I think so for the for the for the teachers, for the instructors, it, it's building confidence. It's speaking, speaking uh, skills, uh, resume builders, maybe the next generation of, of innovative teachers. And for the, the students receiving the information, they're engaged. It's, it's in a content format that, that's in a way that they're used to when they're looking at things on social media, on YouTube, or, or likewise. Uh, there, are, um, there are known branded content makers that these students who are teaching have a personality, and they teach more than one uh, topic sometimes. And so you can, they might find who they, they can relate to. Um, my daughter found that there was a young lady on there who's doing a lot of cooking on there, and she can relate to that young lady um, being near her age and and have her interests, so so we've been we've been watching the app too and and uh, messing around on there and having a, a good time and um, there's benefits to both sides. So this peer to peer uh, teaching and learning is just brilliant. And 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 those who are receiving it, the students who are also receiving the content, I think they're going to gain some um, some self confidence skills too, seeing that they that these content creators, these instructors can do it. Why couldn't they? Why couldn't they be inspired to become teachers as well or, or better communicators as well? Um, so I just, I mean, when I heard about it, I thought, geez, why have, what, what took so long? Esther's been busy. <laughs> Esther's been busy teaching in high school. Now that she's retired, we get these extra gifts. <laughs> we appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to share a fun fact. I've been using my daughter's account to uh, do all the Barack Obama uh, video on, on the speech, uh, learning how to speak like <laughs> Barack Obama. So I'm just going to point that out there. Uh, I've been I've been quietly using her account to uh, do the full module. So, uh, you know, just, just in case Ari's thinking, what's going on here? That, that was me. <laughs> so. Good. That's great. I'm really excited about that. So also the other thing I've been doing is um, – I promoted in the schools because the schools, as I mentioned before, are so rigid. I said, why don't you just change 20% of the school, just 20% time, not 80% of the time you continue to lecture, test, do everything you normally do. 20% of the time you give kids agency, give them freedom, independence, let them do some things together and track fits into the 20% time. So I was trying to make it really easy for teachers because I've been trying to do this for a while, as you know, probably. And so I've done other trainings for teachers. And the number one request, even after I've spent two days talking about it, is like, can you please give me lesson plans for 20% time? And so I realized that they didn't really understand it completely. And so here are the lesson plans. Here is track. You can just tell your kids, go on track, do whatever you want to do. And then you will be, you'll, you'll see they'll come out with amazing skills as a result of doing that. So that's another one of my goals. As to with Tract, I think one of the things that I know we discussed and I felt it, this coming decade is going to be more important than ever, where we are going to have to be global citizens and at least uh, realize for that to happen, collaboration is a must, which is a fundamental uh, part of your philosophy. Um, how important is it for you, for these magnificent course creators, to really build bonds with these students, which not only 
are um, kind of fostering within the app of, of Tract itself, but essentially can go from there in 10 years time where you have this amazingly successful uh, content creator who does all these amazing things and he's connected with this young lady who's been learning and now she's about to go to university but she can say hey I know the next Steve Jobs or I know the next Google people do you think that's one of the aims of what you're trying to achieve so that there's this massive collaboration between these kids regardless of ethnicity faith background doesn't matter where they're from and whatever the socioeconomic uh, situation is that's right. That's exactly the same thing. So we've started just last week, we started clubs for the kids yeah. so that they it's around different interest groups and they can join the clubs and they can then talk to each other, collaborate with each other, and they can be, you know, anywhere in the world and collaborate with other kids in the world and talk about things they're interested in. And it's the first time I think that anything like this has been available on the web. So we're really excited about it. And so all my, all the creators who many of whom are my former students, there's like about 30 of them now. Um, they are, they, they think this is like the greatest thing ever. So we're really ex excited about doing it. And um, so we're still open to more creators because we want to make sure that wherever we are in the world, uh, kids that want to be creators of Learning Pass have that opportunity. So it could be, you know, Europe or the Middle East or Asia or wherever. It's a, it's an international platform. I mean, we just started. It, the, it's not even a year old. Um, and actually, we just launched the platform in November, the end of November. So it's pretty young, but it's already gained a lot of inf a lot of likes. Let's put it that way. People seem to really enjoy it. Yes, so I, I, you know, we, we approached that one hour mark, but um, I, I've just got to ask you this, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Rutley. Um, you've seen so much in your life. You've seen so much change. Uh, you're seeing what's happening now, the complex problems we're facing. When it comes to failure, how important do you feel failure is for people and to get comfortable with so that they can grow from it and and not look at it as something that's demeaning something that's shameful or, or you know what is the world going to say you, you you've seen it all you've worked with some of these biggest inspirational people um you know for you what would your message be to parents who are worried about how they're raising their kids or entrepreneurs who for whatever reason, things have not gone as they should have or just anybody in life who's who's just so afraid of failure but may have failed or is about to fail, what would your message be to them? Well, first of all, I would say you need to think and understand that all innovation involves failure because it's the rare person who can do it right the first time. And that's what I taught in my program, the media program. No one writes an article the first time and gets it right. You have to revise, constantly revise. And then failure is a mindset. You need to explain to yourself that it's okay that you might have made this mistake, but you're going to move forward and try it again. And Winston Churchill had this famous quote in which he said that basically enthusiasm for continuing to do it is basically going from failure to failure with the same enthusiasm you had the first time you did it. And that's what you need to do. Go from failure to failure with the same enthusiasm, the same opportunity, give yourself the same opportunities. And even if, you know, it's a financial issue if you take a look at a lot of the things that have happened in our world that didn't work out perfectly the first time, they might have failed multiple times and then succeeded as time went on. And we need to remember that. Um, no, as I said, you need to remember Winston Churchill. You need to be, you need to accept yourself and your parents 
because I know most of us play these tapes in our heads from our parents. And so we need to remember that our parents were part of the culture that they grew up in, where failure was one of the worst things you can do. And so you have to stop playing those tapes to yourself and stop doing that to your kids. If they don't do it right the first time, just do it again. And hopefully there's no financial consequence. But if there is, then see what you can do about letting that happen. Let them do it another time. And I can just tell you, all three of my daughters, so Susan, Janet, Nan, not one of them had a job when they graduated from college. And a lot of parents are panicked if their child doesn't have job interviews and does a job right away. And so, I mean, Susan didn't know what she wanted to do. And so she decided after two months of babysitting that she was going to go to India for a year. And I said, why India? And she's like, well, it looks really interesting to me. I'm going to go. Bye. <laughs> that was it. She was gone, you know, and um, it was interesting. She had quite the experience. She's, I don't know, set it up. She worked for a magazine called India Today. She was the only female. I was like, oh, really? How did that happen? You know, but, you know, that is what I think it takes. You have to believe in yourself and you have to follow what you're interested in and not what your grandfather is interested in, your father, or whatever. You have to follow your dreams and um, and give yourself some freedom to make mistakes because we all make mistakes. I must tell you, I've made a lot of mistakes too. So we have to spend another hour talking about my mistakes. No. <laughs> so we all make mistakes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think that message is so powerful, uh, not just from a business or entrepreneurial angle or financial angle, but just raising kids uh, or working uh, with friends and siblings and all those things. I think that was a powerful message. So uh, Dr. Rutby, I'll let you uh, take center stage and uh, take it from there. I just wanted to say, Esther, thank you for uh, sharing your knowledge with us tonight and in the book. Thank you for putting that out there for so many people to have access to. Um, thank you for helping me uh, raise a, a, a happier, more fulfilled, uh, as successful as she can be um, future citizen of the world. I appreciate the the wisdom that you've shared and and the messages will stay in my brain as, as we move through high school. <laughs> <laughs> and then college with her. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you for your time. Thank you for the books. And uh, thank you for your investment in the education system and, and for continuing on um, having such a, an effect on so many lives. Well, thank you for inviting me to this um, LinkedIn Live and YouTube Live. And I know it's going to other places. And so I really appreciate it. And um, hopefully we can do some more projects together. Absolutely. Would love it. So with that being said, um, I am going to tell our audience and everybody's going to be watching this after, I will be leaving links to Tract and also put the code there for you to access it for your children or, or sib uh, siblings or nephews and nieces, whoever you want to get involved. Uh, Esther has got this fantastic offer on there so you can access it for free for a number of months and, and I will share that with the uh, links. So with that being said, um, I just want to thank everybody who did uh, stay up and watch this at this late hour. Uh, you could have been with your families, but you decided to be with ours. And uh, Esther, I think this conversation has been enlightening uh, on so many levels. It was not just about the education or even uh, your experience with uh, teaching uh, Steve Jobs children, for example, or, you know, all, I think the most important thing is that you gave us your time. And I could have talked to you for hours and just listened to you. And, and, and to be honest, this is one of the first interviews where I've generally been not as such quiet, but I've just listened. I, I, you know, it was not even about the questions. I just wanted to listen and keep hearing your stories because I think they are uh, irreplaceable. I think what you bring 
to people is so much hope. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're just honored to be here and, and share this platform with you. So uh, thank you so much for uh, giving us this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Thank you again. And I look forward to, to being in touch. Fantastic. So with everybody, have a good night and uh, we will catch you soon. So I'm just going to end this broadcast and it'll just be us three left in a second. So good night. Good night, guys.